Anybody looking forward to Jesus coming back? All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for So come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait your coming soon. Sing that again. So we wait. So we wait, we wait. i 
peace I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me
we thank you for your faithfulness. For those that are gathered here uh, this evening who are just waiting, waiting expectantly on you, Lord, uh, a situation in their life, whether for physical healing, whether it be for employment, whether it be for just a, an issue that they're dealing with emotionally, depression, fear. Pray for those that are here whose hearts are breaking on behalf of their children. And Lord, in each one of these things, and all the struggles and all the and all the trials that we face day in and day out, help us during this worship time to claim that you are the faithful God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. In a constantly changing world, you are ever the same. And we love you for it. And we hear you raise your voices. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, and this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. For those in need of hope, for those struggling with fear, for anyone feeling alone or abandoned, hear the word of God from Isaiah 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. There's a name that levels mountains and carves out highways through the sea. I've seen its power unravel battles right in front of me. There's a faith that stands defiant He sends Goliath to his knees I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my feet And that's the power of your name just a mention makes a way Giants small and strongholds break in their busy way That's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus There's a hope that calls out courage We're in the furnace unafraid The kind of daring expectation That every prayer I make Is on an empty grave And that's the power of your name just a mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there 
going to take a moment to kind of gather around one of our own. Um, I've, uh, I've been known to say a uh, bracelet that I've worn since my mom passed away, and it simply says, cancer sucks. Um, it's not exactly great church language, but it's kind of how I feel about it. And uh, every time I hear about someone who has cancer or is, has lost someone to cancer, that's just the first thing I think of, because it's like, to me, it's the greatest symbol of how fallen uh, the world the world we live in is. Um, so we're going to pray tonight specifically uh, for one person, but just for people in general who have cancer. And uh, so those of you who don't know, I'm going to ask Agnes to come up here and join us. And Ethan and Bruce, we're going to gather around her and pray. 
She's been diagnosed with breast cancer. She's going to surgery on the 12th, which is Thursday. And uh, so we're just going to spend some time praying over her. And we just invite you to join us in doing so. Father God, I just thank you for your love, for your kindness, and your compassion. And uh, Lord, we just lift up Agnes right now. We thank you for who she is, uh, the heart she has, the passion that she has for, for you and for this church, this family. And Lord, we just lift her up and we pray that you will heal her, whether that is through your miraculous power like we just sung about, or if it's through uh, the doctors doing uh, what they do through the common grace that you've given us. We just pray that you will just uh, give her strength this week, that you'll calm her, her spirit, You'll give her a uh, comfort that supersedes any understanding. I pray that you will just hold her as your daughter and just keep her close to you. God, I thank you so much for Agnes and for, for knowing her, for praying for her, for becoming our friend. I pray you would make your glory known through her in all that you are going to do through her life that people would see you and know you for who you are because they see Agnes and they see your mighty work and the love that she gives to everyone who comes in contact with her. I pray you would cleanse her of this cancer. I pray you would give her freedom and give her more life to see um, your work in her life. Yes, Father God, we just, uh, we just surround our, our sister and we thank you for her. We thank you for the, um, the spirit that you've placed in her, the spirit of, of, of servanthood, of, of helping, uh, Lord, the, the many ways in which she blesses us as a church. Um, Father, we thank you for this missionary to Speedway, Lord. And we know uh, day in and day out she is uh, the presence of Christ in that place, uh, even when it's very difficult sometimes and challenging. We thank you for the, the mother and the grandmother that, that she is and, and the, the source of strength that many people uh, rely on and look to. And Father, uh, right now as we gather together as the body of Christ and, and we as elders, we come before you, Almighty God, and we do uh, declare that you still do miracles. You will do what you said, for you're the same God now as you've always been. You are the same God that walked right out of that tomb. And so, in faith, Father, we lift our sister to you, and we ask you for healing. Father, from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, Lord, we ask that you would heal her and that you would give those doctors wisdom, Lord, as they go in to remove every last cell uh, that Agnes may continue on to bless and to love and to serve and to be the joy uh, that she has been for so many of us for so many years now. We thank you for this sister of ours. We thank you that as your kids, Lord, we can come before you and ask in intercession for healing uh, for our sister. Father, we commit her to her. Do wonderful things in and through her, even this week, uh, because we know, Lord, that she's in your capable hands. Thank you that she knows you, that she loves you, and that because of all these things, though she may uh, walk through the fire, she will not be burned. Father, she is your daughter. And you care for her. You love her. We entrust her to you as we pray these things all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Now we're going to uh, turn to our scripture for this evening. It's uh, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 21. It says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in, our, in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know, that, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all, than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is in work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, it feels good to 
uh, be back in the saddle. I'm, I mean, I know that if I asked any one of you to come up and preach, you, you might be quite nervous about that, but this is where I feel ho at home and safe. <laughs> uh, not behind a guitar, that's for sure. We are back in Ephesians, and we'll be together in Ephesians uh, for the next seven weeks until we uh, finish this letter together. To remind um, us of uh, where we've been, well, we've been with Paul in prison. This is likely where he's writing uh, this letter, and it, it, and it could be the last letter that he writes. It could be that he's in prison in Rome right before his execution. And this letter is about the unity that the church, God's people, are called to have in light of the fact that Jesus has resurrected from the dead and is now reigning in heaven. This morning, uh, or this evening in Ephesians chapter 3, which Ben just read for us, we see Paul's prayer that the church be strengthened in the love of Christ for the purpose they would be made complete, or another way you could say it is brought to full maturity as God's new temple people. I think it was about three years ago, Catherine and I went to the San Diego Safari Park this was a frequent visit of ours because we lived just down the street from it. But this d day that we went there was special because they were just opening up their marsupial encounter. The marsupial encounter was a section of the park where little wallabies were able to roam free. You were the ones who were restricted. You had to stay on the circle path around the marsupial encounter, but marsupials, little wallabies, they'd be darting back and forth in front of you playing tag together or rolling on the grass and nibbling on flowers. And if they got close enough to you, you actually were allowed to reach down and pet them. Who's ever pet a wallaby before? This was pretty cool. But the problem was we live in a distracted age. We live in a digitally distracted age. Most people at the marsupial encounter, only experienced time with these wallabies through the filter of their screens and their phones. But some people who didn't have their phones, or maybe the ones who just put their phone away, had the wherewithal to reach out and touch a wallaby, to pet its fur, which is surprisingly thin, although it's very soft. Well, Paul's concern here in Ephesians 3 is this concern that the church would know Christ by experience. Not by knowledge alone. That they would see Christ, not as through a filter or a screen, but in person, in real life. This is a mark of spiritual maturity. Growing as a Christian from infancy to adulthood, from weakness to strength, means... Growing in our love for Christ and his love for us through experience. I mean, Paul will later describe in chapter 4 the infant Christian who is like a ship tossed about by any wind or wave that comes by. But a mature Christian and a mature church, he writes in verse 17 of our passage, is rooted like a plant and is established like a building in the love of Christ. And I wonder, how would you describe your relationship with Jesus? Is it more like scrolling through photos on social media? Or is it more like reaching out and petting a wallaby's fur and saying, I've done that? Is it something that passes you by? Or is it something that grabs your heart? Is your relationship like Jesus simply something you notice? Or is it something you experience? I wonder, as a church, how might our relationship be described by visitors? Would someone visit our church and say, well, their relationship with Jesus seems distant and shallow, kind of like one picture buried among thousands on your phone? Or could they say that they seem to know Jesus personally and deeply? Paul's aim is to encourage the church, press forward into full maturity as a church. He begins, I pray that God would strengthen you. And then he concludes, 
that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is Paul's prayer for the church. This is my prayer for us, for still church, that God would strengthen us in the love of Christ so we would grow to full maturity. So, what does a mature Christian look like? And how do we grow in Christian maturity? Well, we'll look at uh, three things. First, the mature heart. Second, the mature mind. And third, the mature body. First, the mature heart. The mature heart loves Christ. Paul writes in verse 16, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. This inner being or this inner self that he writes about is in contrast to the outer self. You might remember Samson who had a physical display of his great strength or David's older brothers who were the clear candidates to be the next king. But what did the Lord tell Samuel the prophet? He said, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. This inner man. The character that's in a person. What moves you in your affections? So this love for Christ is not a facade. It's a real experience. We're not photobombing Jesus because we think other people will see us in that picture and think we're cool. We're not talking about our private Bible reading and prayer time because we're self-conscious that other Christians might not think that we're really mature or have it all together as a Christian. This is not about a, uh, appearances. This is about a personal experience. Paul's prayer is that we would love Christ as a result of our experience for Christ's love for us. So this is like a Marine who's experienced combat. Deeply impacted, forever changed. Let me uh, be clear, though. I'm not asking how emotionally passionate you are. This has nothing to do with personality. The mature Christian and the mature heart has more to do with direction. Has the love of Christ changed the direction of your life? Or to ask it another way, if you didn't know about the love of Christ, would your life be any different? Would your, the things that you pursue and the reasons that you pursue those things be any different? Has the love of Christ reached your inner self, the core of who you are, creating in you brand new desires that you used to not have and new motivations? The result is, in verse 17, Paul writes, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This word for dwell signifies being at home or to make a place your natural habitat. Mothers, for you've raised children. You know that some days your children can be extra clingy. Like they have to be held all day. And as you lower them, they start to cry until you pick them back up. There are days like that as a mother where the child dwells on mommy. Which means that mommy now lives a totally different type of day than she was planning well, sure, she can still make coffee and go for walks, but she has to do everything differently because someone is dwelling with her. She can't do them the same way. Everything is compelled by this fact. Well, Christ dwells with us when his love has impacted us to the core, to our inner person, which means we can't do business the same anymore. We can't handle the con uh, conflict the same anymore. We can't relate to our neighbors the same anymore. There's something new. Christ dwells in you. I mean, and we see the opposite happening for a church in Revelation. Remember the, the issue with the church of Laodicea? They were lukewarm. Why? What does that mean that they were lukewarm? 
Well, John writes that they grew more and more in their self-sufficiency rather than in their dependence on Christ. And where did that put Christ? Outside, knocking on the door, rather than inside dwelling with them at the table. Does Christ dwell with you? Or is he just a guest who visits from time to time? To summarize this first point, the mature heart. The mature Christian has a strong heart for Christ, meaning they have been personally and deeply impacted by Christ's love for them. And as a result, their course of life is now totally marked by this reality, for he dwells with them. This love is not like that summertime crush you had as a child with a new friend you met at summer camp that you know nothing about. This is a matured love that is built on the depths of what you know about them. The, the mature heart springs forth from the mature mind. We have a call to love someone, and it works together with our call to know someone. So second, the mature mind. The mature mind knows Christ. I wonder if he had this experience. As a young child... You could honestly say, my parents love me. But then, what happens? As an adult, you learn back about the struggles they actually had that you couldn't see. You learn about what they really did when they went to work all day. You learn about how little they actually had, even though, to you, they gave you so much. And then as an adult, then you say, my parents love me so much more than I ever knew. Now, let's go back to the child. There's nothing inaccurate or disingenuous about their belief that their parents love them. But as an adult, we mature and are able to comprehend the love of our parents in different ways, in more dimensions, in greater detail. And that's what we're after here, to truly first know the love of Christ, and then second, to grow up into the love of Christ by learning it in more dimensions and in greater detail so that we would be ever more strengthened by it. We want to be mature Christians, and that requires learning something more about Christ's love for us. So don't settle for, Jesus loves me, this I know, and that's all I know. Don't settle for that. Far from it. What does Paul say in verse 18? Paul says, I pray that you would have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. This is a multidimensional love of Christ for you. And when you search out the dimensions of his love for you, you come into greater and greater degrees of appreciation for his love. This is where weaker Christians become stronger, where less mature Christians become more mature. What are those dimensions of Christ's love for us? Well, Paul has been writing about Christ's love for us all through Ephesians. You can go back and read about all that Christ has done for you. But there are still other angles at which you can get at Christ's love for you. For example, you could study biblical theology. This is a technical term, and it simply refers to following a storyline of Scripture. And in following these storylines of Scripture, we see how Christ's love for you has gone back from creation, before creation. And you can trace it, Genesis through Revelation. And you can trace it in many different ways and through many different storylines. Biblical theology has a brother, systematic theology. And here is still another way that you can gaze upon Christ's love for you. This term, systematic theology, refers to drawing a circle around a single topic of Scripture and seeing all that Scripture has to say about it. So we could look at a topic like Christ's incarnation. The idea that he became a man. 
Or we could look at a topic like Christ's active obedience or his sufferings or his death or his resurrection or his ascension or his heavenly reign. Each of them showing us more and more about his love for you, his people. How has Jesus loved you? Let us count the ways. I could preach sermons on every storyline of Scripture and each topic of Christ's love and still not scratch the surface. But in searching these things out, we mature in our capacities to know and appreciate Christ's love. But just think, has anyone loved you like this? I know your mothers have loved you quite deeply. But has anyone forgiven you more than Christ has forgiven you? Has anyone ever gone to such great lengths to get you back? Has anyone ever given you so many things you don't deserve? Has anyone ever secured for you so many promises than Christ has? Has anyone ever worked so hard to protect you and keep you? Behold the love of Christ for you. Surely such infinite love cannot be comprehended or fully mapped out like finite creatures as we are. So it is that Paul says something perhaps ironically in verse 19. He says, I pray that you would know this love, which is incomprehensible. Our pursuit of knowing the love of Christ is ever ongoing for the love of Christ is incomprehensible. And that's actually a really good thing that it is. Because growing in our maturity in this life anyways, is not a linear process that has a clear beginning and a final end. It's, it's much more messy than that. It's more like a circle. The tide of life brings us out and in again. I've alluded to this earlier in a sermon regarding spiritual entropy, this natural process of subtle breakdown whereby we are called to constantly upkeep and maintain, just like a gardener comes back to the same routine of work each season. So it is a grace of God that the love of Christ for us is incomprehensible because only then can it sustain us through all the years of our life on earth and all the trials that life will bring. There will never not be new things to discover and learn about and be reminded of so as to grow and be refreshed in our affection for Christ. Therefore, praise be to Christ, whose incomprehensible love for us will never fail to provide us spiritual renewal. We have now seen the mature mind, our call to know Christ, to dig deep roots of knowledge from which our mature heart can grow. The mature heart that loves Christ. But now third, the mature body. The mature body. The mature body depends on God. For those who know Paul's writings in the New Testament, you think, uh, you, know, you know how to think about the word body in, in different ways. Yes, it refers to our physical selves, but Paul often uses the term body as a metaphor to talk about the church body of which Christ is the head. Well, this is how I'm referring to the mature body. For when we read between the lines of our passage, we see that loving Christ and knowing Christ is not something that's meant to be done in isolation by individuals alone. No. Rather, loving Christ and knowing Christ is, is a community project with a corporate goal. Paul prays in verse 18, not that we would have power to know Christ more and more in our personal devotional lives, but rather, he writes, together with all the Lord's holy people. So as Christians, we cannot do what we've been called to do alone. I should not only pray and read scripture at home, but I should gather with other members of the church to pray and read scripture. I mean, this is a large part of what we're doing each Sunday as we gather together for worship. And thank God for this call to do it together. Because now I'm not dependent on myself to actually experience the love of Christ and to see it in new ways. So, for example, this happened to me last week. 
I can come to an elders meeting somewhat discouraged. But then I can hear about how God's worked in Bruce's life and how he's been working in Ben's life and be encouraged. I get to reap the benefits of what God, what, what victories God is giving them. Or I can go to Shirley's home group, which I did last week. I could feel tired going there. But, leaving, but I could leave energized and filled with joy to see how God has worked in their life as well. So thank God for this call to do this together with all the Lord's people, as Paul writes. For now, I'm not dependent on something good happening in my life in order to be strengthened in faith and love for Christ. But I can reap the benefits of what God is doing in others. But still, the involvement of others in this endeavor is even more critical than that. Because not only is this a community project, but it has a corporate goal. Not only can we not do what we've been called to do alone, but we cannot be what we've been called to be alone. Paul saves the climactic purpose of this entire passage for the end in verse 19. He writes that you all, plural, y'all, may be filled with the fullness of God. What does this mean? Well, remember what Paul has just written at the end of chapter 2. Paul speaks of the church as God's new temple in which the Spirit of God comes to dwell. So in reading to be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, having been made his new temple people, we remember back to the Old Testament, how when the Mosaic tabernacle was finished being filled, what hap- uh, finished being built, what happened? The Spirit of God filled that. And what happened when um, Solomon's temple was finished being built? The Spirit of God filled that temple. This is why we cannot be what we were, what we're called to be alone, because God has made us new in Christ in order to grow together with other Christians as his new temple people where his spirit dwells. So in one sense, we individual Christians, yes, we need to depend on other Christians, but there's another sense in which we, the whole group, need to depend on God to bring all these things into effect. The mature body is a body that kneels in prayer, dependent on God for all things. Lest we think we can be strengthened by Christ's love and grow in Christian maturity by our own effort, let us remember that this entire passage is a prayer. It is not a command for the church to do something. It's actually a prayer asking God to do something for us. Paul writes in verse 14, the beginning of our passage, I kneel before the Father, and I pray that he would strengthen you through his Spirit in the love of Christ. So we see each member of the Trinity working in harmonious unity to gather his people, to strengthen them, and to finish their work. The Father sends the Spirit. The Spirit shows you Christ. And Christ the Son dwells in us by his Spirit, granting us peace and access to God the Father. We're not only saved by the gospel of God's grace, but we are um, continually growing by the same gospel. It is his gracious love which redeemed us, and it's his gracious love that keeps us and helps us to grow. Now, some of you here may never have experienced the love of Christ. Well, I invite you into this love as it comes through faith in Christ, a faith that confesses to God, I'm living in rebellion before you. I'm a sinner, and I've been trying to justify myself by my own works. I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I come to him repenting of my sin and believing in his perfect life and sacrifice to redeem me and bring me to God. If that is you, and you need that prayer because you've never experienced the love of Christ, I invite you to come to God in prayer, but then to publicly share that story with someone else in the church. 
so that we can celebrate with you, we can encourage you in the faith and bring you into the fellowship of this church that Christ has built by his spirit. But for you, Christian, those of you who have experienced the love of Christ and who and in whom Christ dwells by his spirit. Sometimes we just feel weak and stale in our love for Christ. Well, I want to encourage you. That as sure as the sun rises every morning, so sure is God's love in Christ for you. Pursuing you and renewing you by his spirit. I hope you've been encouraged and strengthened, um, not only as we've um, looked at this passage more deeply, but as we've worshiped God in prayer and in song together. And as we gather as a church each Sunday, and as we gather in, in other ways throughout the week, let us, let us not settle for snapping a picture of Jesus, but for reaching out and touching him. Of having a living experience as we set our minds and our hearts on the immeasurable expanse of his love for us. Only then when we depend on God wholly for all things pertaining to our faith in Christ and love for the church, can we have the confidence to say with Paul, as he does in verse 20, Praise be to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this evening again, this beautiful sunny evening. I thank you for the mothers who were able to worship with us. I thank you for Agnes, for her time in our church, for our opportunity to pray over her. I pray you would fill these saints with your love and strengthen them by it. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
and grace.